What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of The Artist Reads the Bible. Today, I'm starting with Acts 25. Um, I don't know. We have four chapters left. I'm not sure how far we'll get. What do you see? We'll wing it, won't we? As always, I got my decaf java juice. Got my highlighter in case I need to mark something. And I got the living word of God right here. This, for those that don't know, is New Living Translation. Um, I actually thought about going back to my New King James Version, but I didn't. So I'm going to finish it out with this. Next book, I might switch it up. I don't know. We'll see. Anyway, anything crooked. Hold on. That bear. A little slain it. Might have a touch OCD. I don't know. Let me get these spectacles off so I can actually see something. Oh, my eyes are tired today. Oh. Give me a little more Java juice. And let's get this party going, shall we? Mm. I just made that. Oh, it's good. It's good and hot and good. Chapter 25. Three days after Festus arrived in Caesarea to take over his new responsibilities, he left for Jerusalem, where the leading priest and other Jewish leaders met with him and made their accusations against Paul. They asked Festus as a favor to transfer Paul to Jerusalem, planning to ambush and kill him on the way. But Festus replied that Paul was at Caesarea and he himself would be returning there soon. So he said, those of you in authority can return with me. If Paul has done anything wrong, you can make your accusations. About eight or ten days later, Festus returned to Caesarea, and on the following day he took his seat in court and ordered that Paul be brought in. When Paul arrived, the Jewish leaders from Jerusalem gathered around and made many serious accusations they couldn't prove. Boy, sounds familiar. Oh yeah, what's currently going on? But I won't go down that path. Paul denied the charges. I am not guilty of any crime against the Jewish laws or the temple or the Roman government, he said. Then Festus, wanting to please the Jews, asked him, are you willing to go to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there? But Paul replied, no, this is the official Roman court, so I ought to be tried right here. You know very well I am not guilty of harming the Jews. If I have done something worthy of death, I don't refuse to die. Okay, that's a little. If I have done something worthy of death, I don't refuse to die. If you've done something worthy of death, you don't refuse to die. It's kind of like an oxymoron there, isn't it? Anyway. But if I am innocent, no one has a right to turn me over to these men to kill me. I appeal to Caesar. Festus conferred with his advisors and then replied, Very well, you have appealed to Caesar, and to Caesar you will go. A few days later, King Agrippa arrived with his sister Bernice to pay their respects to Festus. During their stay of several days, Festus discussed Paul's case with the king. There is a prisoner here, he told him, whose case was left for me by Felix. When I was in Jerusalem, the leading priest and Jewish elders pressed charges against him and asked me to condemn him. I pointed out to them that Roman law does not convict people without a trial. They must be given an opportunity to confront their accusers and defend themselves. When his accusers came here for the trial, I didn't delay. I called the case the very next day and ordered Paul brought in, but the accusations made against him weren't any of the crimes I expected. Instead, it was something about their religion and a dead man named Jesus. Uh, that man ain't dead. He was resurrected and ascended back into heaven. Thank you very little who Paul insists is alive. He is alive. I was at a loss to know how to investigate these things, 
So I asked him whether he would be willing to stand trial on these charges in Jerusalem. But Paul appealed to have his case decided by the emperor, so I ordered that he be held in custody until I could arrange to send him to Caesar. I'd like to hear the man myself, Agrippa said, and Festus replied, you will tomorrow. So the next day, Agrippa and Bernice arrived at the auditorium with great pomp, accompanied by military officers and prominent men of the city. Festus ordered that Paul be brought in. Then Festus said, King Agrippa and all who are here, this is the man whose death is demanded by all the Jews, both here and in Jerusalem. But in my opinion, he has done nothing deserving death. However, since he appealed his case to the emperor, I have decided to send him to Rome. But what shall I write the emperor? For there is no clear charge against him. So I have brought him before all of you, and especially you, King Agrippa, so that after we examine him, I might have something to write. For it makes no sense to send a prisoner to the emperor without specifying the charges against him. And that's 25. Let me get a little Java juice here. Mm. I'll tell you what, these cups, I'm pretty sure I got these at Walmart way back before the plague started. And, uh, man, they were cheap. I want to say like four or five bucks a piece. I bought two of them. And these things keep coffee hot for like hours, man. Freaking good cups. I'm not going to lie. Give me a couple more. Look at all that stuff peeling off. The, our dishwasher has played havoc on these cups. They're good cups, but they don't hold their finish very long. Mm. Man, I love coffee. We're going to go ahead and do 26 too. Then Agrippa said to Paul, You may speak in your defense. So Paul, gesturing with his hand, started his defense. I am fortunate, King Agrippa that you are the only one hearing my defense today against all these accusations made by the Jewish leaders. For I know you are an expert on all Jewish customs and controversies. Now please listen to me patiently. As the Jewish leaders all are well aware, I was given a thorough Jewish training from my earliest childhood among my own people and in Jerusalem. If they would admit it, they know that I have been a member of the Pharisees, the strictest sect of our religion. Yeah, remember Paul, who used to be Saul, uh, persecuted followers of Christ because he was a Pharisee. And yeah, he went after him very vehem vehemently. Is that the right word? Vehemently? I think so. I don't know. Now I am on trial because of my hope in the fulfillment of God's promise made to our ancestors. In fact, that is why the 12 tribes of Israel zealously worship God night and day, and they share the same hope I have. Yet, your majesty, they accuse me for having this hope. Why does it seem incredible to any of you that God can raise the dead? I used to believe that I ought to do everything I could to oppose the very name of Jesus the Nazarene. Indeed, I did just that in Jerusalem. Authorized by the leading priest, I caused many believers there to be sent to prison and I cast my vote against them when they were condemned to death. Many times I had them punished in the synagogues to get them to curse Jesus. I was so violently opposed to them that I even chased them down in foreign cities. I told you he was a pretty bad dude. One day I was on such a mission to Damascus, armed with the authority and commission of the leading priest. About noon, your majesty, as I was on the road, a light from heaven brighter than the sun shone down on me and my companions. We all fell down, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic. Okay, I was right. Jesus spoke Aramaic. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is useless for you to fight against my will. Who are you, Lord? I asked, and the Lord replied, I am Jesus, the one you, the one you are persecuting. Now get to your feet, for I have appeared to you to appoint you as my servant and witness. Tell people that you have seen me, and tell them what I will show you in the future. And I will rescue you from both your own people and the Gentiles. 
Yes, I am sending you to the Gentiles. That'd be me and you. To open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. Then they will receive forgiveness for their sins and be given a place among God's people who are set apart by faith in me. Okay, I'm going to get a little coffee. I'm going to reread that part. Then they will receive forgiveness for their sins and be given a place among God's people who are set apart by what? Faith in me. You have faith in Jesus Christ. That's your ticket upstairs. Faith in Jesus Christ. And so, King Agrippa, I obeyed that vision from heaven. I preached first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that all must repent of their sins and turn to God, and prove they have changed by the good things they do. See, I marked that part, and I know why now. Jesus talked about to his disciples that you will know them by the fruit that they bear. So, technically, yes, accepting Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, repenting of your sins, believing that he died on the cross for your sin, was resurrected three days later, and then ascended back in heaven, and he is living up there with God right now. Um, that gets you the Holy Spirit, that saves you, that's your ticket to heaven. But he also expects us to do good works in his name. Um, and as a Christian, a good follower of Christ, you should want to do this. Um, you should want to turn from sin. I mean, we're all going to sin. It's inevitable. Not a single one of us can live our lives without sin. Um, but we can strive not to sin. And, you know, as good followers of Christ, we should want to help others, help the needy, help the poor, um, help widows, help children, help help anybody that needs help, you know. And, and really, when it comes down to it, doesn't the world really need more of that anyway? I mean, think about it. This world, there's so much hate, there's so much turmoil and strife and division and just, and everybody's at each other's throat. Wouldn't it be so much better if we, better if we just learned to love each other and we decided to help our fellow neighbor. Um, you know, even if you don't agree with them, help them anyway. Because doing that, man, you may change their life. And you, you don't, they never know what the outcome may come from that. You know, your small act, um, act of kindness may totally change their outlook on life. And they may very well come to Christ. You never know. So don't miss an opportunity, people. Some Jews arrested me in the temple for preaching this, and they tried to kill me. But God has protected me right up to this present time, so I can testify to everyone, from the least to the greatest. I teach nothing except what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer and be first, the first to rise from the dead, and in this way announce God's light to Jews and Gentiles alike. Okay, now see, I want to talk about that. That part actually confused me a little bit. That the Messiah would suffer and be the first to rise from the dead. Okay, but technically he wasn't the first to rise from the dead. Because while Jesus was alive, what did he do? He rose Lazarus from the dead. So Lazarus rose from the dead. And I'm not mistaken, didn't he rise a little girl from the dead as well? Um, so I know of at least two people that rose from the dead before Jesus Christ was crucified uh, and raised from the dead three days later. Maybe they mean that he's the first one that without, because Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead and the little girl. You know, without his direct intervention, that would not have happened. But Jesus rose from the dead 
as direct result of God's action. There was nobody on earth that rose him from the dead, so it might be what they're talking about. Oh, the first rise from the dead. In this way, announced God's light to Jews and Gentiles alike. Suddenly, Festus shouted, Paul, you are insane. Too much study has made you crazy. But Paul replied, I am not insane, most excellent Festus. For I am saying, what I am saying is the sober truth. And King Agrippa knows about these things. I speak boldly, for I am sure these events are all familiar to him. For they were not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Agrippa interrupted to him, Do you think you can persuade me to become a Christian so quickly? Paul replied, Whether quickly or not, I pray to God that both you and everyone here in this audience might become the same as I am, except for these chains. Then the king, the governor, Bernice, and all the others stood and left. As he went out, they talked it over and agreed, This man hasn't done anything to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, he could have been set free if he hadn't appealed to Caesar. And that's 26. But, I don't know if I'll do 27. If I do 27, I might as well do 28, huh? Actually, I think I might stop there. Because it's, well... I don't know, let's see. 27 is not terribly long. But 28, I don't know, we might just do it all. Where are we at here? Oh, we only 16 minutes. You know me, when I'm reading God's Word, 16 minutes ain't going to get it. Mm. It's just piping hot. Love these cups. Wish the finish lasted a little longer. Probably would last longer if I hand wash them, but who's going to hand wash when you've got a dishwasher? What's the point in having a dishwasher? But dishwashers are very hard on finishes like this. My other one looks something just as bad as this one. Mm. All right. So, he would have been set free if you hadn't appealed to Caesar. But now he's going to Rome. And he said before, um, he was told to go to Rome to speak to the Gentiles. That be me and you. Well, unless you're, I don't know what your religion is, um, but that'd be me and possibly you. So, but he kind of knew that that was going to happen, didn't he? So, anyway, let's go ahead. I'm going to keep going. 27. When the time came, we set sail for Italy. Paul and several other prisoners were placed in the custody of a Roman officer named Julius, a captain of the Imperial Regiment. Aristocrus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was also with us. We left on a ship whose home port was whoa, a, a dram, a dramatian, a dramatian. Some of the names back in, whoo boy. On the northwest coast of the province of Asia. It was scheduled to make several stops at ports along the coast of the province. The next day, when we stopped, docked at Sidon, Julius was very kind to Paul and let him go ashore to visit with friends so they could provide for his needs. Putting out to sea from there, we encountered strong headwinds that made it difficult to keep the ship on course, so we sailed north of Cyprus between the island and the mainland. Keeping to the open sea, we passed along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, landing at Myra in the province of Lycia. There, the commanding officer found an Egyptian ship from Alexandria that was bound for Italy, and he put us on board. We, have se we had several days of slow sailing, and after great difficult difficulty, we finally neared... Really? C-N-I-D-U-S. I have never encountered a word. I've encountered plenty of words like P-N, P-F. The P is silent. So, but what is C-N? Sinitis? Nitis? Is C silent? I don't know. 
We're just going to say Sinaitis. I don't know. But the wind was against us, so we sailed across the creek and along the sheltered coast of the island past the Cape of Salmoni. We struggled along the coast with great difficulty and finally arrived at Fair Havens, near the town of Lacia. We had lost a lot of time. The weather was becoming dangerous for sea travel because it was so late in the fall, and Paul spoke to the ship's officers about it. Men, he said, I believe there is trouble ahead if we go on. Shipwreck, loss of cargo, and danger to our lives as well. But the officer in charge of the prisoners listened more to the ship's captain and the owner than to Paul. And since Fair Havens was an exposed harbor, a poor place to spend the winter, most of the crew wanted to go on to Phoenix, farther up the coast of Crete, and spend the winter there. Phoenix was a good harbor, with only a southwest and northwest exposure. When a light wind began blowing from the south, the sailors thought they could make it, so they pulled up anchor and sailed close to the shore of Crete. But the weather changed abruptly, and a wind of typhoon strength, called a northeaster, burst across the island and blew us out to sea. The sailors couldn't turn the ship into the wind, so they gave up and let it run before the gale. We sailed along the sheltered side of a small island named Cauda, where with great difficulty we hoisted aboard the lifeboat, lifeboat being towed behind us. Then the sailors bound ropes around the hull of the ship to strengthen it. They were afraid of being driven across to the sandbars of Sirtis off the African coast. So they lowered the sea anchor to slow, slow the ship and were driven before the wind. The next day, as gale force winds continued to batter the ship, the crew began throwing the cargo, cargo overboard. The following day, they even took some of the ship's gear and threw it overboard. The terrible storm raged for many days, blotting out the sun and the stars until at last all hope was gone. No one had eaten for a long time. Finally, Paul called the crew together and said, Men, you should have listened to me in the first place and not left Crete. You would have avoided all this damage and loss. But take courage. None of you will lose your lives, even though the ship will go down. For last night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I stir serve stood beside me. And he said, Don't be afraid, Paul, for you will surely stand trial before Caesar. What's more... God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. So take courage, for I believe God. It will be just as he said, but we will be shipwrecked on an island. After midnight on the 14th night of the storm, as we were being driven across the Sea of Adria, the sailors sensed land was near. They dropped a weighted line and found that the water was 120 feet deep. But a little later, they measured again and found it was only 90 feet deep. At this rate, they were afraid we would soon be driven against, against the rocks along the shore. So they threw out four anchors from the back of the ship and prayed for daylight. Then the sailors tried to abandon the ship. They lowered the lifeboat as, they, as though they were going to put out anchors from the front of the ship. But Paul said to the commanding officer and the sailors, You will all die unless the sailors stay aboard. So the soldiers cut the ropes to the lifeboat and let it drift away. Just as day was dawning, Paul urged everyone to eat. You have been so worried that you haven't touched food for two weeks, he said. Please eat something now for your own good, for not a hair of your heads will perish. Then he took some bread, gave thanks to God before them all, and broke off a piece and ate it. Then everyone was encouraged and began to eat, all 276 of us who were on board. After eating, the crew lightened the ship further by throwing the cargo of weed overboard. 276 on a boat. Man, that must have been a big boat, huh? When morning dawned, they didn't recognize the coastline, but they saw a bay with a beach and wondered if they could get to shore by running the ship aground. So they cut off the anchors and left them in the sea. Then they lowered the rudders, raised the foresail, and headed toward shore. But they hit a shoal and ran the ship aground too soon. The bow of the ship struck fast, while the stern was repeatedly smashed by the force of the waves and began to break apart. The soldiers wanted to kill the prisoners to make sure they didn't swim ashore and escape, but the commanding officer wanted to spare Paul, so he didn't let them carry out their plan. 
Then he ordered all who could swim to jump overboard first and make for land. The others held on to planks or debris from the broken ship, so everyone escaped safely to shore. That's 27. Here in a minute, we will finish up X. Hmm. Oh, I love it. Love, 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 love coffee. Hmm. That's all I drink, coffee and water. That's it. Occasionally, hot tea. I don't like cold tea. Occasionally, I'll drink hot tea. Boy, I love coffee. Coffee and water, that's all I drink. And this, I have one of these full in the morning of caffeinated coffee. And then the rest of the day and up through the evening, it's decaf. Which I have recently learned still has trace amounts of caffeine in it. So, probably need to stop that drink more water. All right, let us continue on with Acts 28, and then we will, oh, the Bible come out of the cover. The cover is really too big for this Bible, which is weird, because this Bible is like massive. I mean, you don't see that? This thing is huge. There we do. All right, 28. Once we were safe on shore, we learned that we were on the island of Malta. The people of the island were very kind to us. It was cold and rainy, so they built a fire on the shore to welcome us. As Paul gathered an armful of sticks and was laying them on the fire, a poisonous snake, driven out by the heat, bit him on the hand. The people of the, on the, island, of the island saw it hanging from his hand, said to each other, A murderer, no doubt. Though he escaped the sea, justice will not permit him to live. The ball shook, but ball, but Paul shook off the snake into the fire and was unharmed. The people waited for him to swell up or suddenly drop dead. But when they had waited a long time and saw that he wasn't harmed, they changed their minds and decided he was a god. Mm, no. Near the shore where we landed was an estate belonging to Publius, Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us and treated us kindly for three days. As it happened, Publius, Publius's father was ill with fever and dysentery. Paul went in and prayed for him, and laying his hands on him, he healed him. Then all the other sick people on the island came and were healed. As a result, as a result we were showered with honors. And when the time came to sell, people supplied us with everything we would need for the trip. It was three months after the shipwreck that we set sail on another ship that had wintered on at the island, an Alexandrian ship with twin gods as its figurehead. Our first stop was Syracuse, where we stayed three days. From there, we sailed across to Re Regium. A day later, a south wind began blowing, so the following day, we sailed up the coast of Putoli. Pu Putoli. There we found some believers who invited us to spend a week with them, and so we came to Rome. The brothers and sisters in Rome had heard we were coming, and they came to meet us at the forum on the Appian Way. Appian Way. The others joined us at the three taverns. When Paul saw them, he was encouraged and thanked God. When we arrived in Rome, Paul was permitted to have his own private lodging, though he was guarded by a soldier. Three days after Paul's arrival, he called together the local Jewish leaders. He said to them, Brothers, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Roman government, even though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our ancestors. The Romans tried me and wanted to release me, but they found no cause for the death sentence. But when the Jewish leaders protested the decision, I felt it necessary to appeal to Caesar even though I had no desire to press charges against my own people. I asked you to come here today so we could get acquainted and so I could explain to you that I am bound with this chain because I believe that the hope of Israel, the Messiah, has already come. They replied, We have had no letters from Judea or reports against you from anyone who has come here, but we want to hear what you believe. For the only thing we know about this movement is that it is denounced everywhere. 
So a time was set, and on that day a large number of people came to Paul's lodging. He exclaimed, explained, and testified about the kingdom of God and tried to persuade them about Jesus from the scriptures. Using the law of Moses and the books of the prophets, he spoke to them from morning until evening. Some were persuaded by the things he said, but others did not believe. And after they had argued back and forth among themselves, they left with this final word from Paul. The Holy Spirit was right when he said to your ancestors through Isaiah the prophet, Go and say to this people, When you hear what I say, you will not understand. When you see what I do, you will not comprehend. For the hearts of these people are hardened, and their ears cannot hear, and they have closed their eyes, so their eyes cannot see. And their ears cannot hear, and their hearts cannot understand. And they cannot turn to me, and let me heal them. So I want you to know that this salvation from God has also been offered to the Gentiles, and they will accept it. Yes, we will. For the next two years, Paul lived in Rome at his own expense. He welcomed all who visited him, boldly proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ, and no one tried to stop him. And that is Acts. That is Acts. Oh, goodness. All righty. Finished up X. Wasn't sure if I'd get all four chapters done or not. A little long-winded, but we uh, persevered and got through it, did we not? So, that's pretty good. Hey. I need to read You know how many of these are dirty up because of these? We'll be putting this at my desk. Oh my goodness. Look at here. Another one. What in tarnation? Look at here. Another one. I'm not using that. That got paint all over it. So we'll be keeping that one in here. This one's all right though. No, it ain't here. Got freaking paint on it, too. All right, we're going to leave them in here. I got more of those. I got stuff I didn't even know I got had. Anyway. Let me go through this art room one of these days. I need to thin out a lot of this stuff. A lot of my supplies are going to dry up or come too old to, to be utilized. So, yeah. Anywho, I hope y'all enjoyed the video. I um, hope you got something out of it. I know I did. Um, remember, as always, if you have any prayer requests, leave them down below. Um, or send me a message, get a hold of me on Facebook, however you can, and uh, I'll be more than happy to pray for you. Um, and if you need a Bible, let me know. Um, won't cost you anything. You just tell me where to ship it, and I pay shipping and everything. I'll get, I will get it to you. Don't worry about that. Um, you just let me know where you want it. And uh, until next time, y'all, we'll. Uh, I don't know. We'll probably start with Romans next. I know I told you I was going to read one and then skip one. Well, I don't skip it. I read it for myself because I read faster when I'm reading on my own than for YouTube. But I think, I don't know, because you got Romans and then you got 1st, 2nd Corinthians. So, I don't know. Romans is a pretty important one. So, I don't know. We'll see. I'll probably do Romans for YouTube. Well, I'm okay. I'll probably do the next three for YouTube. And then after that, maybe I'll skip one. I don't know. But anyway, I'm going to hop off here, y'all. Um, hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, hit that like button, subscribe button, and hit that little bell so you can be notified when I put out more content, which, as you've noticed, I've been doing more of lately. So and I'm going to keep that up. We'll try to, so.
Hang with me. I'm going to get you some good content out there. So anyway, until next time, I love each and every one of you. Y'all, please, please, please be good to each other. And I'll bring you something again real soon.